it working? Okay. I'm not sure why I'm up here at the moment. I'm looking at... Um, now I know why I'm up here. <laughs> Our lecture has arrived. Um, welcome again uh, to this series which uh, attempts to make some sense, begin to make some sense out of the issue of space in art and architecture. Um, a a sub-theme which all of you will just have to put together because the lecturers of course won't be hearing each other although they know each other's work. Uh, the sub-theme of the relationship between art and architecture uh, is obviously there and uh, it's, it's quite exciting because I think we have uh, we're not interested in uh, or I think for this series in an architecture which does not recognize and learn from art and we're also not interested in an art uh, which doesn't recognize architecture and learn from it. The three architects and three artists are all people who um, in fact are in this category that we in fact are interested in. Um, from our side, and I'm saying because this is a school of architecture, well, I'm sure there are many artists here in the audience, but from our side as architects, um, it's quite interesting to look at um, the work of a number of artists, sometimes they're called site-specific or environmental. Um, and for me, the, the term is not so interesting. Um, but a number of artists who are doing work which is interesting to us as architects at a number of levels. Um, might be sometimes quite technical. Other times it might have to do with our very uh, sort of method and purpose. Um, and one of those people we have tonight, and I'm going to embarrass the person a little bit, and also show that I have to do this. Um, <laughs> um, I'm not going to do all of this. Um, uh, Mary Miss was uh, born somewhere in the middle of America. Is that right? In where? It's close enough. Uh, uh, in terms of education, though, she's, she's sort of coming home to come to the West Coast, but also has a foot in the East Coast in terms of her education, um, and has been um, working since 1968, doing an extraordinary number of works. Um, many of them that you'll see tonight will be will carry with you for many days. Uh, one, uh, one, and maybe more, um, will, uh, I think, carry with you for the rest of your life. It's a, an extremely powerful work. Um, I won't tell you which one. Um, it, maybe it'll be different for each person. Um, and that's a hard thing to do. Uh, uh, so I have a great deal of respect for that. Um, her works are more situations than objects. Um, in that they do not depend on visual perception alone, but chart a more thorough, multi-sensory experience, the apprehension of space. Controlling what the viewer uh, sees uh, of her spaces and of their settings, uh, Mary Miss combines acting, choreography, and camera work rolled into a single visual directive to her audience. Much of the richness of her structures is drawn from two interrelated mental activities, perceptions of space and conceptions of remembered images. And finally, I think the most important thing written about her, these are not my words, um, in all her art, Mary Miss focuses on space as a primary physical reality. Hers is not the illusionistic symbol depth of painting, the primarily metaphoric space of sculpture or the functional enclosure of architecture. Although her work partially partakes of all of these, her space is real before it is anything else. And I'll let her describe that. Mary Miss? Uh, 
Um, I think I'd like to have the slides turned on right away because I'm being blinded by the, uh, the spotlights in my eyes and it'll be a little easier. I think if I can have an image in a dark room instead. Uh, I'm very happy to be here talking to a group of architects. Um, I've been doing it more frequently in the last few years. Can you turn off these lights some way, please? Somebody? Is it impossible? <laughs> can I have two? Can I have two uh, permanent uh, people <laughs> holding an umbrella on either side? Okay. Um, the thing that's really been interesting me over the past 20 years is finding a way as an artist to move from the confines of the gallery and museum world into the real world in some way uh, to find a, a place for artists once again in our society uh, rather than being relegated to uh, the halls of high culture and in my investigation about how to do this how to make that move into this uh, world that we all uh, live in. Uh, I found my richest area of investigation and inspiration and um, just the hottest spot of contact, I think, to be with architecture and architects. and um, It's a connection that I, I really um, treasure, uh, but it's not an easy one to make. Um, I think it's absolutely essential for those of us who are artists who have decided to step into this public realm uh, to find ways to build these bridges, to um, to work with, uh, find people that we can work with, that we can talk to. If we're going to you know, it's fine to have the idea that you want to go out into some, uh, into the public realm, into the real world, but if you can't get things built, if you aren't uh, able to participate in the, the construction of things, if you don't have somebody to talk to that you want to work with, it's never going to happen. Uh, I didn't arrive at this point of uh, hoping to uh, stay in this public arena all of a sudden it wasn't an idea that you know was kind of fully developed in my head and, and I proceeded but the ideas have been accumulated slowly over the years and I'd like to give you some sense of how that accumulation took place of how the issues were brought uh, to the forefront of my thinking um, I would say, first of all, that I was trained as an artist, as a sculptor. I was never a painter. Uh, I started out doing uh, very traditional, you know, bronze casting and uh, marble carving, that kind of thing. Uh, moved on uh, from that, trying to find a way to, um, I think, uh, coming to uh, into my own work in the mid-60s. The ideas of the minimalists uh, were very important at that time. Uh, the involvement of the viewer with the work. Uh, but I think that one of the things that I felt most strongly about was that I wasn't interested in the monolith, much less the monument. And if I was going to integrate something uh, and make it less uh, of an object apart, um, it seemed the most reasonable thing to step outside and start working outside of, of interior spaces. And much of the work has been involved with uh, outdoor pieces. Some of it's come back to interior so that now the work kind of splits uh, between the two. <laughs> I think I've got it. Can you hear better now? Um,
anyway, I think that as I proceeded, the um, the thing that probably was most compelling to me to take that step outdoors, uh, outside of the uh, container of the museum, was uh, probably first of all that the ideas within that container were becoming too thin for me. Uh, I think that uh, the formal issues uh, of sculpture at that time were, were getting pulled so taut that as soon as I stepped outside into the real world and had to deal with all of the, the complexities of the site, the history of the site, the sociology of it, and everything else, uh, the issues as an artist became much more interesting to me. I will start with this first piece, which was done uh, in the early 70s on landfill along the Hudson River in Battery Park, right next to Battery Park. And uh, I had been living in the West most of the time, although I was born in New York City, I really didn't grow up there. And I moved to uh, New York in the late 60s and found myself kind of uh, penned in with no place to go, no place to work. And this was a place not too far from where I was living, a big expanse of newly created landfill, flat open space. And I decided to put uh, a work out in this space. Um, I had done a number of pieces before this, uh, trying to, uh, again, rather than impose a single image on the environment, uh, to slowly, or, or to find a way to, to make uh, the experience of uh, looking at something a little bit more integrated with the context. So I built this piece, which is made up of five uh, panels with the hole cut out of the center, as you can see. And the thing that happened with this is that you couldn't really see it until you got up to the front of it. It was like looking at billboards on, you know, from the end as you came into the site. And it was only when you walked around to the front of it that the piece materialized and you saw this column of air descending into the ground or almost uh, like seeing the circle pulled into the ground. But starting at this point, and earlier as well, but especially with a piece like this, the movement of the viewer was really important to me. Making it, I wanted to make something that people couldn't just turn their heads and look at and get right away, or at least think that they had gotten. They really had to be involved physically to, with walking to the front of the space, or of, of, the, of the piece. Um, I would like you to kind of notice this site and this cutout in the back, because uh, towards the end, I'll be talking about it again. Another piece from this uh, time was done in Oberlin, Ohio, uh, at the college there. It's about seven feet square, about two and a half feet deep. And uh, the thing that was especially moving to me or interesting about it was, um, first of all, that you couldn't even see it until you got up to the edge of it. And then that it was as though a part of the ground had been removed, exposing this network that suggests it's being extended underneath the grass all around. There was a slightly, um, I think, maybe tenuous uh, connection that the viewer had with the work in that it's a little bit like a trap or something. It has that uh, suggestion. Uh, but finding a way to, for the person who was looking at the work, uh, finding a way to get an emotional connection or a response uh, was the thing that was at that point most interesting to me and remains most interesting to me today. Uh, this piece was done uh, also in the early 70s. Uh, it was in a wooded area uh, outside of Greenwich, Connecticut. You had to uh, ford a stream, walk through a woods to get to it. And once you reached the site, you had the choice of climbing up and looking over the edge or stepping into the interior. The title of the piece is Sunken Pool. 
Uh, it's about 20 feet across and lined with galvanized steel. I chose the site because I knew there was a lot of groundwater here. Uh, and the piece was constructed in the midst of all the groundwater with the pumps going and then allowed to fill up again. But you would come through a very dense area of brambles. This was placed right on a path. And so the path through the woods was interrupted by this structure. And when you looked inside, the galvanized metal, since this was a temporary piece, and all of the pieces you'll be seeing for a good while were temporary, uh, it was up for a short period of time. And during that time, the galvanized steel remained very reflective. And the water and sun reflecting off that made this uh, drum-like container a very, um, very much a space apart from that kind of space that you had just walked through. Um, I think that at this early point, Susanna Torre, uh, the architect, did a book maybe a couple years later about women in architecture, and she included this piece, and I asked her why she was including it, because uh, even though I spent almost all of my time looking at structures and architecture and gardens, I didn't think of myself as being connected with the architecture in a specific uh, way. Um, and it's funny to me to think that I wasn't acknowledging this, uh, you know, thing that I was uh, so interested in. But the imagery from the built environment has been absolutely compelling to me from the earliest time that I've been working. And, you know, it's, um, I find that the complexity and density of our, uh, uh, you know, average environment to be extremely interesting. And I guess uh, I find within it the complexity that uh, maybe decorative uh, carved plaster rosettes or wrought iron uh, provided at another time. I think we have that vocabulary available to us. I've always used it in that sense, that we can use uh, uh, this, this imagery that's around us uh, in a similar way or to a similar effect. This work was done uh, in Art Park in the mid-70s. It's uh, called Blind Set because it was made as a set for a film that I did. I've done a couple of films, it's something that, and it's something that's very interesting to me because since I'm so involved with the viewer and how the viewer moves through a site, uh, the, doing a film is the most natural thing because you can um, you know make the per procession for the viewer and also you can provide views that wouldn't be possible otherwise at a certain point I was doing two things that were very expensive though filmmaking and a big outdoor pieces and the, the, the filmmaking has uh, gone by the wayside and I'm not sure that it will be picked up but this was the set for a film that started um, and I think, I must say, it interests me much more as a set than as a, an object or as a sculpture in the sense that one goes up and looks at it because I found that people only would go up and look at it and, you know, take a, a quick glance and walk away. And the thing that was most interesting to me is what I did with the film, which was start circle, circling at the lowest part of this piece, which is uh, has you, um, your eye level just about uh, at the uh, V cut in the ground, but I start circling uh, around and in the first view you see only the steel, then you see some gravel, then you see a couple of bands, finally you see the V cut, and as you look out of each of the V cuts you see uh, a highway, uh, this blank view, a tree, there's something a little bit more in each, and then as you come up again you see the, the whole landscape, re landscape revealed. From that, I switched to an aerial view, which was much closer, which was quite close, and then pulled away to this most distant view. And I think that sense of going from the very interior of something to its most exterior view was, was something that was really uh, interesting to me. This is a work that was done in about 1978 at Nassau County in Long Island. And it's about four and a half acres. There are three tower-like structures. 
uh, two mounds that you see on, in the middle on either side, and then an underground structure in the, in the front that you can see. This is uh, about 16 feet square at the top, and you can climb down on the ladder and walk down underneath uh, this ground that you've just walked across. And I think the thing that was most interesting to me in this situation was the fact that you were walking under the skin of the earth, that you had a chance to go back under the ground that you had just crossed, but you didn't know uh, how far back that whole ground that you had just walked across was undermined because there was uh, a corridor that went all the, way, all the way around this sunken courtyard. And in the back wall of the corridor, there was a window every eight feet Behind that window, the ground was excavated. And you, it, that's uh, the sense that I mean you don't know how far the ground that you'd walked across was hollowed out, because you could only see the darkness in there, not what the definite uh, boundary was. Uh, in the upper part of the complex, there were these three tower-like structures. And this is about uh, 18 feet high and it has an opening that goes all the way up the center with screening around it. And you can see uh, one of the other towers in the distance. But again, that sense of trying to get the viewer to move through the piece, as you walked up to each of these towers, you found that they were different sizes, so that this one was only 15 feet square, and that the last one, which you had seen between the legs of the first one, is extremely small so that unless you're very thin you can't even get between the legs to crawl up uh, the, the center opening. Um, as I was doing this there were some things that were really interesting to me. In a couple of different ways I'm making the person who's looking at this or walking through it question what the boundaries are uh, of the space that they're taking for granted uh, so usually. Um, I think what was uh, in my mind, especially in this work, was an experience that I'd had kind of time and, and again. Uh, as I was growing up, we were always uh, moving from army post to army post uh, through the country and taking long car trips and stopping every time there was a historical marker along the road. Um, like, but it would, you know, it wasn't in the east. It wasn't in Europe, it was in Nebraska that you'd find this historical marker. So when you got out, there would be a few uh, uh, foundations remaining, maybe an old well. Uh, there wasn't much to look at. There were, this wasn't the, the ruin of the Grand Castle, you know, or anything like that. But as I was doing that, it was really interesting to me to piece the, uh, the place together and to construct my sense of what had been happening there. And I'd mentioned to somebody earlier, I think it's very interesting, I have a sister who's an archaeologist, and I think that somehow we both took that experience and, and, you know, moved in different directions with it, because even today, if we go someplace and are looking around, we're kind of looking at information or collecting it in a similar way, but to different ends. But the thing that I wanted to do with this is to put these structures, to, to construct uh, maybe the perimeters of a complex, so that whoever it was that was, was moving through it was going to be constructing that place for themselves, not only my construction of it, in other words, my, the construction of my ideas about you know, the, one's perception of space and depth, but uh, also you know, just what they might be thinking uh, about what these parts were and how they related one to the next. I think it was during this time that I became much more aware of that public that was interacting with the work, uh, mainly because um, it, it, this was a public park, a county park. The people who came here would uh, really, they had very little knowledge about sculpture. And as I was working out there, or as, when I came out in, uh, at later times, people would um, be, you know, climbing these things, sitting in them, eating their lunches. Uh, people who worked in the area found it a, to be a place that they wanted to come and spend time. Um, but if you started talking to them and told them it was a sculpture, all of a sudden it wasn't okay. 
because it wasn't a guy on a horse or, you know, it wasn't something that they could recognize. But as long as they didn't have that definition put to it, uh, they, they had access to it. They had, uh, you know, a curiosity about it. They didn't know what it was for, but they were much more open to interacting with it. Um, and I think that was an important thing for me to be observing. This gives you some sense of the, the whole site. The title of this piece is Perimeters, Pavilions, and Decoys. Uh, this work is a piece that was done in Dayton, Ohio, and it's called Staged Gates. The first wall that you see is about 50 feet wide, and uh, additional gates go up the hillside. Um, I, when I get to a place and you know, start to uh, work. I'm always, cho you know, usually choosing the site that I want to be working. And um, I came to this hillside and thought that it would be extremely interesting to make a gateway into the woods, uh, so to speak. Um, but I went around, I think before I had even formulated the idea, I was interested in the site, but I went around and started looking at a lot of structures in the area. Uh, there was, uh, were some old gardens that were kind of burned out. Um, there, was, there were the old locks on the Erie Canal nearby uh, with the kind of forced perspective uh, of the uh, locks one after the other. Um, so I'll usually go someplace and spend a good bit of time going through the area, the surrounding area, and um, finally, you know, developing the idea. And I, again, have the sense that maybe what I'm doing when I'm building these pieces is focusing on information that is um, something that's very uh, interesting visually, but that people wouldn't usually notice. So I have, uh, you know, I have a great deal of respect for um, Anybody, everybody, the average person's uh, visual acuity, you know, their ability to see things, but I don't think they have the chance to or aren't provided with the opportunity. And as an artist, I guess I feel like I'm coming in and focusing on visual experiences that are contained regularly within their own environment, but somehow putting a, a spotlight on it or somehow making it a little bit more immediate or accessible. But in this piece, one thing that I was also interested in was that kind of proscenium uh, or stage-like opening with the additional gates going up to the top of the hill that get closer together. And the last gate at the very top is like uh, a, you know, a very human-sized passageway, the size of a doorway, which takes you uh, into the, the wooded area. This was a work uh, done in fairly uh, close uh, time proximity. Uh, it was done at Lake Placid during the Winter Olympics, or just before the 1980 Winter Olympics. It's uh, called Veiled Landscape. And uh, as I came to the Olympics to do this work of art, I mean, you all have had the experience of uh, having a something like that going on in your neighborhood, but I felt that uh, the artist's involvement in a sporting event was, uh, you didn't have much of a chance as an artist put up against that, uh, uh, that kind of uh, entertainment competition, since art is usually considered uh, just to be entertainment at best. Uh, so I decided to kind of even though I always wanted people to move through my pieces, I thought, well, I'll just put a viewing platform there, kind of making fun of the fact that they wouldn't. Uh, and then I put this screen up in front so that once they walked up and looked out, it was this very irritating thing that I remember from being a kid and trying on one of my mom's hats with a veil. And you've got the veil with, you know, I never understood how people could actually wear them because you always want to get it away so that you can actually see things. So I have this uh, kind of postcard frame of this very beautiful Adirondack landscape uh, made by the wire mesh, but hopefully uh, by an irritant almost 
provoking people to go further than that. The whole piece had been built on a cut, an existing cut in the woods where a water line had been put in, and that cut goes straight down for about a mile. Uh, so I was very interested in, in using that uh, cut that was already there. Once you get past that veil, though, you have a curtain of posts separating you from the landscape. And then another series of fence-like structures. And finally, a gateway, which is the introduction to the landscape. And I really feel that that's what the piece is. It's not something to look at just for itself, but is really to give you uh, an entryway into this very uh, you know, beautiful landscape in the distance. There are a number of things that are happening here with the perspective, with this gateway that's, you know, 60 feet wide and 20 feet high, looks very small uh, from the top of the hill, so you get down and find its proportions have changed uh, considerably, um, or its size has changed. But um, I think there were a number of things that I was drawing on. I'd uh, done a lot of reading about different kinds of gardens, uh, the kind of uh, visual procession that you can find in uh, Italian uh, gardens, for instance, but also um, Japanese gardens where there's this notion of borrowing the distant view and trying to make it part of an immediate context. And so connecting that distant view with the immediate structure was something that was interesting to me. And I mention this uh, kind of background material because as I'm developing my ideas, uh, I spend a tremendous amount of time reading about things that are of interest to me, looking at photographs, um, looking at uh, a lot of, uh, you know, vernacular structures, concurrent structures, but a lot of historical ones as well. And um, I think that in the, the, uh, this situation, using this material, uh, what I'm most interested in is finding that um, there are situations that arise again and again throughout history uh, that suggests that there's some important uh, or some fundamental need for uh, a certain kind of experience. And um, I think the thing that I'm very curious about is how can we bring that kind of experience to our own context and uh, find an appropriate way to express it within our own context. So. Uh, as I'm developing the ideas for a piece, I may have, oh, you know, easily a couple of hundred different references that I've got in mind of different kinds of structures or images or uh, situations. Uh, I'm not at all interested in collaging them together into some kind of pastiche of, uh, of images and form. The only thing that interests me as I'm doing this is to uh, build a structure of meaning in some way, with meaning, rather than de denying the connections uh, of those historical ref references. Um, I, I, I may be denying uh, what they mean immediately uh, within their original context, but I'm trying to supply the meaning in this new context. Um, to maybe clarify that a little bit, uh, I spent some time in Mexico a few years ago and I was really moved by uh, the um, high Baroque uh, churches down there where you would often have this most elaborate, um, you know, uh, end point of the church with the aisle that you're approaching, uh, you know, to being drawn uh, to the altar. Um, and it doesn't matter whether you're a participant in the mythology of Catholicism or not, that it's a very compelling kind of experience. How can one transfer that to another situation and make it uh, and allow the experience to be available even though the, um, the context is completely different? This work was done in um, Governor's State University just outside of Chicago in 19, 
1983, I believe. This is the first large-scale permanent piece that I have done. And um, I, I guess I started working about 1966 or something. So all of the things that you've seen up to this time and a number of others that I'm not showing you as well were pieces that were put up for uh, sometimes a month, sometimes six months, but they were down uh, always within fairly short periods of time. Uh, there are artists who are interested in that kind of uh, short-lived project. I'm not one of them, uh, but I was using always very small budgets to build the pieces, maybe, uh, you know, $2,000, maybe uh, $10,000, but um, of necessity, they were always uh, temporary in nature. And the thing that was problematical about that was that the thing that I valued most was the actual experience of walking through the piece. I feel that photographs are so distorting of uh, any, um, you know, real structure or space, and yet that's all I've got to uh, show of uh, all of those early works. So finding a way to get something built of real materials where it's going to be staying for a while was, was something that I valued uh, a great deal. Uh, anyway, this is uh, a campus of, uh, I don't know, maybe a uh, hundred acres, or it might be more than that, uh, in a suburb south of Chicago. And it's a commuter campus, so there are a bunch of parking lots around a cluster of buildings, and people come to the parking lot and rush into the buildings immediately, and they're surrounded by open farmland that's part of the campus, and it's very beautiful. It's really the beginning of the prairie at this point and yet no one even looked in that direction. So again, with that notion of trying to get people to notice some, some of the things that are surrounding them immediately, I was trying to get their attention focused uh, outwards. So in this very flat landscape, I built this mound-like structure with posts road, uh, radi radiating out from it to the edges of the field. Uh, this perfectly flat land turns out not to be so perfectly flat because the posts remain level and they're about three feet high at one end and maybe 16 feet high at the other. So immediately there's uh, something that's being pointed out uh, to you. But once you get up to this, you find that there's this sunken courtyard that's about 60 feet square or off square uh, that you can climb down into. This gives you a sense of the connection between that campus and the structure. Once you're inside, uh, the piece is built as, uh, as a well, as a step well, in a sense. That central uh, area is about 15 feet deep and has that tower-like structure that goes down into it. If there's been a lot of rain, the next square fills up with water, or then again, this additional square fills up with water as well. Um, I have gone back a couple of times since the piece was built and found that, uh, you know, it is being used in the sense that I hope that it would be. People come out, spend time, you know, sitting out in this area, reading or whatever. And uh, if you have the ability, if you want to, to climb up into the tallest tower, which you might remember from the first shot, which is about 16 feet above ground level, and where you can really get uh, an image of the, uh, what the piece looks like from above, and also the posts that radiate out uh, in a star-like pattern around the field uh, from that central piece. As I was developing this work, again, there were many different images that I was drawing from, but uh, especially fortifications and gardens, and I think the fortification reference is fairly obvious, uh, but also reading a lot about Persian gardens and their um, original development as uh, places of protection in that kind of arid and open landscape. So the sense of protection that a garden might offer or that a fortification might offer, somehow there's a, a shared um, uh, 
feeling there to me that I was drawing on or that I was overlaying uh, in the work. Um, I wanted to show you a series of interior works uh, that have been done not separately, although I'm showing them separately, but a lot of the ideas uh, that I've investigated in some of the outdoor works were often originally uh, looked at in some of the interior pieces. Uh, one of the things is that forced perspective. This is an early work called Sapping, and it's about 20 feet long, so you can step into it. There's galvanized steel lining this uh, rough wood, uh, the rough wood walls, and you can step in until it gets too small to enter further. Uh, this work is about uh, nine feet square and it's up on a wall. It's very large. Uh, the central uh, form becomes uh, quite a lot like a doorway and there's a space behind that doorway that you can see through the grid and it suggests the possibility that that space continues through to the other side or that one could be observed through uh, uh, someone looking out uh, from the other side of the wall. Uh, another work about the same time. It was one that you could step into. I used the silver paint uh, on it the, with uh, black on the back of each panel because once you stepped inside, in the first shot, you could see the you know, edges of the piece very clearly and what the limits of the piece were. And then as you stepped inside, you saw only darkness to either side. So that definition that you had been so sure of was, was no longer existing and that you could, you could move through to a certain point only. But this piece was done, for instance, before uh, the Perimeters Pavilions piece, where there's that underground questioning of how far uh, a space uh, goes back. And uh, kind of um, reverse inquiry in a way, this is a piece called Screened Court. And there are concentric octagonal structures. And it's kind of like one of those uh, carved ivory balls where you can keep seeing another structure within another structure, but you can't ever finally uh, see the smallest uh, of the interior structures. It begins to get too dark inside. Uh, this uh, work has a com fairly complex structure on the wall that again has the darkened space behind where you can't tell what the boundary is. Uh, the screen separating the viewer from it. And again, this, this piece was done before the veiled landscape piece, so it you know, suggested uh, something more that I, I then took uh, outdoors. Um, in the uh, more immediate past, I've been working on a series of pieces that I think of as interior additions in the sense that they're windows or doorways or room dividers. Um, they're usually commenting on the content that's inherent within uh, those structures. In this case, um, suggesting a window, um, it's uh, this thing opens to the other side of the wall. It can fold flat. The, those central pieces uh, are movable. If uh, It's also possible to take that piece out of the wall and close the piece, uh, close that opening up with the, the uh, silver uh, element that's leaning up against uh, the wall below that. Um, I think right now within the art context there's a lot of talk about functional art and uh, a lot of rhetoric attached to it and um, I think that uh, function is one way that art can begin to be integrated back into the uh, uh, in, you know environment into the built context but for me I think um, it's not so much the uh, explicit function of the thing that's interesting as it is the implications of that uh, structure or that element, such as a door or window. In this case, this is a room divider. It uh, is about five and a half feet high and it folds up flat or it extends out. Uh, a doorway, this is about uh, ten and a half feet high 
by 10 feet wide and the different elements open separately. It's called door mass. Another uh, piece that was actually here in Los Angeles uh, in a show about, uh, with a strange title, Artists as Social Designer. I never quite was sure what that meant, but uh, um, turning the, the doorway into a passageway, uh, an extended passageway, was uh, interesting to me. And most recently, in this, this kind of series, is a work that I did this summer for the Dallas Museum. And it's called Arrivals and Departures, 100 Doors. It's about 22 feet wide. And uh, there was, I had a wall constructed. This was from the siding show that was at the La Jolla Museum. And it traveled, so it was a show of drawings of uh, Alice Aycock and Richard Fleischner, George Trakas, and myself. And in each uh, location that the, the show went, one of us built a piece. Alice built uh, a work in La Jolla, and I did it in Dallas. And so I had them build a wall with uh, an opening that was about eight and a half feet high and uh, maybe uh, 15 feet wide. And then I constructed this as a freestanding screen in front of that opening. In that screen, there are these doors within doors within doors, and then uh, separate, do separate doors that have mirrors on them that reflect it so that it looks rather like rather than the 100 doors that there actually are, that there may be uh, a thousand doors. Uh, another work that was done recently is uh, in the entry of the museum in Framingham, Massachusetts, the Danforth Museum. And it's a funny museum that was built in an old school that's been rehabilitated. And uh, I walked in, I guess it had been a high school or something, and I walked in and found this uh, it's very school-like marble and plaster entry with a recessed ceiling. Um, and I decided that I wanted to build something into this, uh, this entryway to affect you know, the, one's experience as you walked into this place. So I uh, set a, this large copper disc up into that uh, ceiling, supported by a wooden frame, and then with a number of different layers behind uh, the copper going up into the recessed area. On the floor, there's also a copper disc, much smaller size, with a mirror in the center. Here you get a sense of, of the, the layering in the ceiling. But the thing that was interesting to me was that when you stepped up to the mirror, you had that kind of endless column between the floor and ceiling that was set up. Uh, a couple of other uh, larger scale interior works. This one was done at the Fogg Museum uh, in the early 80s, I think 1980. And uh, it's a beautiful neoclassical courtyard uh, that um, I if approached with great trepidation, I must say. Um, I at first couldn't imagine how I could do anything <laughs> without its uh, being totally overwhelmed by the architecture. But I've been very interested for a long time in stage sets. And uh, I think the false spaces that are suggested in a number of my pieces go back to that uh, original interest. I decided to do something that was uh, like a, a set, had the complexity of a set that could be viewed from all the different balconies of this courtyard. You could look down on it, you know, as you went up higher and higher. I think there are three different levels. Also, I, the thing that I value so highly in uh, my work, having the viewer go through, walk through the piece, was not possible here because of insurance reasons. And I think that I ended up even adding additional complexity to it so that, the, you know, at least the visual movement through it would be a rich one. 
But in a work like this, I think the importance of uh, exploring and developing a vocabulary for myself uh, was extremely important. The piece is about 20 feet high and maybe 45 feet from this, uh, this edge to the, the front, from top to bottom. Uh, another interior work, uh, this is called uh, Study for a Courtyard, Approach to a Stepped Pool. And it was, uh, I thought of it as a full-scale model of something that I, of a courtyard that I would like to actually build. It was done uh, as part of, actually, part of an art and architecture show at the ICA in London. Uh, as you came to this piece, you had many choices about how you were going to enter it. Uh, you could go behind the first wall, or the second wall, or the third wall, or you could go walk to the back. This is down one side. Or walk back to another side where there was a covered uh, little passageway there, uh, then to the steps at the end. Um, but after you had walked through all of these layers, you got to this screened porch-like structure with a walkway beside it, overlooking this pool, uh, which was done in sand. I th the idea that I had was that um, if I was really building it, those would be trays of very shallow water. And the image that I had in mind, I guess, was that you know, if you throw a rock into the water, you get those, uh, the, the ripples circling out from it. And I wanted to, if I was doing it with real water, be, uh, it was like I was catching those, those ripples uh, at different levels. Uh, to uh, give you some idea of projects that I've worked on that have or haven't been, <laughs> often cases haven't been built, uh, this was uh, one of the earliest collaborations that I did. Um, as I said, the kind of uh, connection that I've been interested in building uh, over a number of years with uh, architects um, is something that's quite important to me. And I did this uh, collaboration with Susanna Torrey, an architect in New York, and it was a competition for Spectacle Island, uh, an island in Boston Harbor. And it asked for uh, it had a very complex uh, program with, uh, you know, uh, campground, uh, place for boats, uh, and nature area, and it also called for a sculpture, an artwork. Well, Susanna took a broad interpretation of including a sculpture in uh, the site, and what we ended up doing was kind of carving the whole front edge of the island there uh, in the proposal that we did. Um, so that you would actually be um, walking over a, a sculpted uh, landmass as you went down to the water on the front edge. But it was a very uh, interesting uh, time. Uh, we were working with a number of other people, Galen Kranz, who's uh, interested in park design and function, uh, is a sociologist um, up at Berkeley, and. Uh, I found it to be a very uh, complex but uh, re rewarding experience, uh, even though it was just done in the format of a competition. Uh, this is a proposal for a piece that was done uh, for, for the 42nd Street Redevelopment Association. And it was uh, to be built between 9th and 10th Avenues. It was actually funded by uh, an NEA uh, Art and Public Places grant, but somehow the uh, client never got it together to uh, build the work, actually, but it's a narrow slot of land uh, in a row of small theaters that have been um, kind of re revived or put in the uh, existing buildings along that block. And in this narrow slot, I, when I started out uh, to build this, I thought that I would put, I don't know, maybe trees or something back there as part of the structure. But as I walked around the city, I found that, again, the spaces that were most compelling to me in the city and to many other people from the looks of uh, 
the, the boards around the sites were the construction sites, that the density and complexity of those sites was just uh, really interesting. So I decided to try and do something that had some of that complexity but was accessible that you could actually walk through. So there are these elevated walkways that lead to uh, that central uh, circular structure with a sunken pool down it and, and then you, as you get to the back, maybe I can back up here, there are these balcony-like structures where you can go up and look down uh, at what you've just walked through. Um, at night I felt that nobody in their right mind would go in this space on 42nd Street so I uh, wanted to light it very dramatically uh, so that it was almost like a stage set. And I think the image that I had in mind was that it was as though the facade of one of those little theaters had been removed so that you saw the, the set that was behind the walls. And so I thought that that kind of visual a uh, activation of the place at night would be interesting. I think that, um, you know, it's, it, I think architects, artists, we all have trouble with people stereotyping us. And if people have seen a few pieces you've done in an open landscape with trees, then they presume you wouldn't be interested in an urban context. And uh, I think that over the years as I've been working, the thing that's most interesting to me is how you can put something into a context, and it doesn't matter how different it is to me. It's, it's how that integration that it takes place that I'm really, uh, um, that's what's you know, most interesting about it all. Uh, this is a site, um, it, it's the things they ask artists to do for, the, uh, for small amounts of money. I, I don't know if it would amaze architects or not, but uh, a woman died in Port Townsend, Washington, who knew nothing about art, but she wanted to uh, leave her uh, $200,000 or something like that, or $150,000, I'm not sure which, uh, for an artwork in the city of Port Townsend, which is a small Victorian uh, um, community, uh, these, all these old buildings um, on the Olympic Peninsula right across from Seattle. Um, she had a statement in her will that said if the artwork was not uh, built, that the money was to go to the seeing eye dogs. And so there were constant headlines in the newspaper about give the money to the dogs instead of to the artist because they were so worried about having an artist come in and impose something on that community. Um, anyway, what we were given was a completely derelict site. It was where uh, the, par the ferry used to come in and uh, that's, that structure sit uh, sticking out here was uh, where the ferry would come. But all of the paving the, uh, the boardwalk there, the dock coming out in the water, we're all practically ready to fall down. And so what are you going to do? You've got to get the place so it's safe enough to walk on, but, you know, uh, somehow come up with something interesting as well. So I decided to try and use the elements that were there uh, and make them a part of or an extension of uh, the thing that I was building. Uh, the water that came into this site would come into this kind of crotch that was formed between the uh, land and the, the pier jutting out. It was, I think, the, the most activated uh, place uh, on the site, and I decided to make a focal point there and use this compass-like image uh, marking both in the land and the water this circular pattern with a tower so that you could go up and view down, look down at this uh, compass-like form. Um, within the uh, pavilion, there was a four-foot diameter pipe that was going to be planted into the, uh, um, the ground that allowed the water to come in so that you could see what the level of the tide was, whether it was high or low by the bands uh, black and white bands that uh, marked the level of the tide. You can see the paving pattern is, is marked out on this side and then on the other side the posts continue the form in the water. Uh, this is a work that is um, about to be uh, built in uh, 
Tempe, Arizona, in a new plaza that they've built uh, in the downtown area. And uh, this is a work that I did after working on another project, a very complex urban project of two and a half acres. Uh, I'd worked on it for so long, and these people sent out a competition request, and there was a 40-foot diameter circle. It was so, it was such a relief to have 40 feet that I could <laughs> control completely and uh, that I didn't have to worry about. I couldn't even move this uh, from the site in any way. But um, as I was uh, looking at this, I've spent a good bit of time in the Southwest, and the plaza isn't very interesting. Uh, and it's rather wide open and barren. Uh, and I decided that I wanted to try and make uh, a space of more intimate, of a more intimate. From the Southwest, for instance, you'll often see um, either living trees, but pr um, often just branches put up in a circle to uh, keep sheep in. Um, there's, uh, there was to be water in this piece, and uh, I decided to use it extremely sparingly in the uh, way that it always appears in that uh, context. So there was this uh, slight uh, band of water that you step across right at the beginning, and then you go down steps, and you're walking from flagstone to flagstone with only maybe an inch of water, two inch band of water between them, to the central pool where you walk out on that spiraling uh, expanded uh, wire mesh uh, walkway. Um, it's kind of like a, a ceramic bowl or something that's been sunken into that uh, plaza. Another work, uh, a proposal for a piece that is going to be built in The Hague in a Berlaga Museum. Uh, it's uh, most closely identified with having the largest Mondrian collection, a wonderful uh, place to see a lot of Mondrian paintings together. But the building itself is just a beautiful, beautiful uh, building. It was done in the 30s. And, uh, as I, the courtyard had been neglected for a long time and replanted badly at some point. And uh, I was asked if I would like to do a piece in the center of it. And um, as I thought about it, I decided that I wanted something. The building is built to look like a factory, even though it's an art museum. And there are even things that are kind of big fake smokestacks up at the back. Uh, so I decided to do something that was like I wanted to make a heart to the building in some way, um, almost whether it was the heart of a, in the sense of a machine, that this was like a machine part uh, at the center. I also wanted it to be uh, take on a different visualization from different levels, so that when you're down at the ground level, you've got those uh, kind of, that kind of circular passage that you're looking through. Once you get to the center pavilion, you, you've got this dome of glass above you, and then there are steps, concentric circles of steps descending into the ground, so you're enclosed by the, the dome on that side as well, above and below. And then the, the project, which uh, I was referring to as being so difficult and you know working on it for so long, uh, when I showed you the first slide, uh, the piece that was done at Battery Park. Um, it was done on the site of the South Cove, which is that little cutout uh, there. About two years ago, uh, I was asked to collaborate with the firm of Cooper Exted, who'd done the master plan for Battery Park. They'd done the existing esplanade that's built uh, there now uh, to develop the two and a half acres uh, around the edge of this cove, which is kind of the center of the residential district, as opposed to the North Cove, which is the World Financial Center, which uh, Pelly has done. Um, I, I 
found it uh, to be quite unbelievable that I was coming back uh, 15 years later to the same site uh, since the people who had selected me didn't realize that the piece, uh, that first piece with the descending circles had been built on this exact site. Um, it's also about a 15 minute walk from my house and uh, I, you know, uh, go off and build things in Tempe, Arizona or San Diego or something, but it was really wonderful to work on the development of something that that a place that I knew so well. But um, whenever I'm going to a site, I'm, you know, looking at trying to draw on the, the history of that place or this, you know, what that place has been. And this is uh, all landfill up to the very edge of the site, which is a platform 40 feet back with water going underneath it. So you've got this completely, um, a site with no history to it except its own construction and my former contact with it. Uh, this gives you uh, a, an image of what the overall project uh, will uh, someday look like in the sense that there will be buildings, apartment buildings all around it. I was working with Stan Exit on this uh, work, um, and we came with um, great trepidation. <laughs> this was a shotgun marriage. Uh, we, uh, I had been selected as the artist to work on the South Cove. It was uh, made extremely clear that I was going to be working as an equal uh, with whoever the architect was, and th that person hadn't been selected yet. Finally, uh, Stan was uh, uh, selected to do this, and having completed the esplanade, the walkway just above uh, this South Cove, he had little question in his mind, I think, when he started out about what was necessary, and that was to just order a lot, of, a lot more lampposts and uh, granite and paving material. I think that's what he would have done if he had been left uh, uh, to his own, um, you know, with this. What I would have done, I'm not sure, but I think that what ended up being very interesting was how our different uh, experiences of that place or needs or, or something uh, affected the final uh, proposal. Um, what we ended up doing is trying to uh, continue the elements that were already in existence, but to introduce an, an absolutely different uh, experience of the waterfront than you would find anywhere along this whole uh, redevelopment of Battery Park, and especially very different from what was happening in the North Cove. Uh, the thing that I felt most strongly about, I think, was trying to make the water accessible in some way. It's one of the great frustrations of living in Manhattan that you're surrounded by water, but you don't have any access to it, uh, except in a few very limited spots. And it always seemed to me that if you could get from the density of that uh, Wall Street canyon-like area uh, and have access to the water, it would, ex it would change your experience of that dense place once you got back to it. Um, so, uh, when I first started to work on this, um, it w was uh, going to be a marina, and I was very much opposed to the idea because I felt that it was really too small to be a, this is the only reason there isn't a marina there now, I think, is that it was actually too small, but I really didn't like the idea that the water wasn't going to be accessible, that at some point there would be big, you know, fences to keep you away from the, the boats on the other side. So uh, that was, I think, one of the first obstacles to uh, get across. As we began to think about what was going to be there then, uh, I think one of the notions that we began to, uh, began as a real strong starting point was uh, the image of what the river might have been like before. Uh, so we long set back from the actual cut 
that was of the uh, land meeting the water. We built, or, or are going to be building, a rock edge which is suggestive of the, the original natural river bank. I think that uh, the notion of trying to make this a much more sensual, uh, softer, much softer place was very important to me, to both of us. Uh, immediately as you're coming from the north, which is the, the main direction that people approach the site, there's this pergola with trees in it to begin to suggest to you that something different will be happening there. And what happens is that the traditional uh, lighting, benches, paving pattern continues on that upper path, or else you have the choice of going down to the water's edge and getting uh, a little bit closer. Uh, this shows the, this uh, boardwalk that's attached to the seawall where you can go closer again. This gives you another sense of what that uh, rock edge would be like. Uh, on the water side, some of the most beautiful structures that you see along the water are the old piers that are uh, half up and half down. And when the, the pier has been removed, you've got the beautiful uh, pilings that are in the water. And, um, I think that was uh, that image of uh, as a way of integrating the water and the land was uh, especially interesting to me. This gives you some sense of how the uh, plan works with the whole site. Just at the top here, this is a major street called South End Avenue, and as you come down to that, you're brought into the site with this kind of curving mass of trees. Susan Child was the landscape architect that worked with us on this project, and her suggestions of um, plant material and how they, the plants could be used was also extremely important and, and, and you know, really integral part of the development of the uh, scheme. But the main mass of trees that you see moving down to the uh, final or the kind of con concluding piece of the, of the project is um, a multi-stem honey locust tree, which is a very kind of uh, delicate uh, uh, and rich uh, kind of tree. Uh, one of the things that Stan had felt strongly about was providing a conclusion to South End Avenue in some way. And as he was thinking about it, he was thinking of some kind of tower-like structure uh, to mark the end, and that wasn't anything that I could really deal with in my way of thinking. But I think that in, in another sense, we provided that conclusion with uh, the, you see the, the way the, the final work spirals uh, around uh, at the end. What's happening there, when, when you walk along that rock edge, um, you finally come to uh, a viewing tower, which I can show you a drawing of uh, in the next slide, that you can go up into and look down on uh, the, the complex that's being uh, constructed. That's one thing that was really important as we were looking at the site. The Statue of, the, of Liberty is right out uh, off the corner of the site. and. Um, I had seen an exhibition at the uh, Urban Center of uh, models reconstructing or con you know, showing the construction of the crown of the Statue of Liberty, the whole head of the statue. And it had been such a beautiful uh, image to me. And looking back at those photos that I had taken of the model, uh, we ended up developing this um, structure that kind of comes out of that crown. Now, I'm sure that nobody's going to make that association, but it was a, a, a rich connection to me in some way. Uh, so once you get to this end, what we did was, once I found out that, that there was water underneath this whole edge going back 40 feet, I wanted to take the edge apart and get the water on the land side again. So we ended up uh, removing part of that existing platform and building an island-like structure which suggests that it's been flipped over into the water. Uh, you can walk across the, the seawall and it's as though you're walking across the, the bridge. 
a, a bridge and then go out onto the jetty that curves back in. But this very kind of organic, curvilinear uh, uh, form that you find here can be seen, it can be walked on, it can be seen from the apartments, but also it can be, be seen uh, uh, to some extent from the tower structure. Um, I have to say that, uh, you know, as I was starting out doing this, I, I, you know, I said that I had great trepidation about it, and I think that what I wondered is could, I'd been saying for a long time that people could collaborate. I was saying that artists could work in public situations, but when faced with all of the codes and, you know, providing for the turning radius of the fire engine and, and uh, wheelchair access, uh, I was um, worried <laughs> about what was going to come out at the end. And I feel very um, strongly that we were able to get to the end of this process, working together. Uh, if people continuously ask us which parts belong to which of us uh, in the, the whole uh, plan. And I must say that there isn't that distinction there. The, the ideas were really uh, developed uh, jointly. But um, finally, I think that there is, for me in the work that we, uh, the plan for which we've finished, uh, a, there's a potency, there's an emotional content that I have to have if I'm going to do any work. And if, you know, if I had gotten to the end of this and felt that I had some nice design, I would have been extremely disappointed and would never have tried to do another public work in my life. Um, I think that one of the things that worries me most as I watch uh, things beginning to be built is that once artists go into the framework uh, of working under you know, very compressed timelines uh, with budgets that they could never have imagined having access to before, but with pressures about how, those, you know, how that money is going to be spent, I think that rather than public art, that we're going to end up with uh, more corporate art than we uh, really need. In other words, things that end up looking as though they're just well-designed uh, elements that might have, have been put there anyway. Um, how can a place be made uh, special in some way? How can it be given some potency? How can it be given a strong emotional uh, content or connection for the viewers. Uh, this is this is my, my sense of uh, of what's necessary. It's uh, you know I but I, I guess I have to say that I feel like it's just an investigation at this point. I mean, I really see this kind of work as being not just a collaboration with another artist or architect, but with um, the people who are going to be using it or looking at it. In other words, you put something into a place, whether it's a person's house or it's a, you know, a public, uh, you know, esplanade, whatever it is, and it's as though you're only doing half of the work. And the people who are coming to that place and using the, 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 the place are the ones who are completing it. So I have ways that I think that the connections are going to be made where there can be some potency. Uh, between the the artists, the public, the your you know whatever you want to call them, but it's like I think we're just beginning these investigations when we have to see what happens. Maybe maybe nobody will you know, want to spend any time at this waterfront. I hope I hope that's not the case though. One last piece that I wanted to show you is a work that was done uh, in uh, St. Louis in a sculpture park, and I'm not particularly interested in sculpture parks because they're, again, it's kind of like being in the zoo. Uh, but it does allow you to investigate ideas uh, without anybody, you know, suggesting that you should change your mind or whatever. This a little bit blurry uh, slide that won't stay focused gives you some sense of this, of the complex that I'm going to be showing you individual slides of. Uh, it's about a two and a half acre uh, site in, on an old estate that's part of this uh, county park in St. Louis. 
And uh, I came upon it and found, I couldn't quite tell what at first, but it looked like a very large uh, excavation of some sort. I wasn't sure if it was a quarry of some kind. Uh, as I investigated more, I found out that it was the uh, foundation of an old pool that had been built to look like a pond. And um, around the pool, there were a number of existing uh, platforms, concrete foundations of bathhouses and, and stairways, of some wonderful old stonework. And I decided to use this as a found site, so to speak. It was uh, a very beautiful series of structures, and I decided to incorporate those uh, with additional structures that I would be building. And uh, so we'll move through that uh, space and see some of the structures. This is a kind of entryway, gateway. And a lower pavilion and an upper pavilion that are separated. And once you go into the lower pavilion, there are some seating that's been provided, a little bit of cover. And moving on to the uh, upper structure, stairways that go up a back route or front stairs. Underneath the floor of that structure. And this is the second floor. And this is looking out at this strange pool that I described to you before. It's, ve it's very strange since it was supposed to look natural. It's got this undulating uh, bottom surface to it. But as with the piece that I did in London, for instance, where you're kind of you're going through all of these layers of walls, uh, kind of ac accumulating. Um, I images as you proceed through that structure. The same is true in this piece. You can't at any point see the whole thing. You just see parts and then another part and another part. This is this curved walkway that you find at the other end of the pool leading to a pavilion. and a walkway that it leads out. Um, the, the place is quite evocative because you can't quite tell what has been there earlier, what's been put there more recently, especially as the you know, wood kind of grays out and uh, looks like it's been there for a while. But um, I think that as I've built these things, um, there's something there's uh, something that really stays in my mind uh, strongly. Something I read recently. It's a book called *The Memory Palace of Matteo Ricci*, and it's talking about uh, a memory system that was in common uh, use, um, where people who had a, a great deal of information that they had to keep in mind would uh, construct a, a space with objects in it and they would attach uh, certain uh, pieces of information to those structures. And so when they were trying to remember the, the series of facts or whatever, uh, they would start imagining that space and those elements within the space. And um, that's such a, a compelling idea to me. It cuts such a, a strong um, thing that I would love to have happen. That's what I would love to be able to do, is to build something that people walk into and or through, and that one thing they look at one thing and a memory is triggered, or an association, or that there is some contact, some connection with that element, and then to the next, and then to the next, and they accumulate the uh, experience, experiences of those uh, contacts that they've just been made, making. Uh, I'm not sure if it is possible, but that's... Uh, in my uh, dreams, what I would love to do. Um, do you have any questions about any of the things that I've been showing you? Maybe we could get some lights on, in case anybody. 
Excuse me? Um, on the, the things that were of a temporary nature, no, I always just figured it out myself. Uh, but of course, with the Battery Park piece, for instance, there are all kinds of engineers, structural engineers, you know. <laughs> no, that one I was just uh, building uh, myself. Yes. I, I'm pretty good. I'm a good carpenter. <laughs> I'm a good engineer. <laughs> uh, I used to, but I don't anymore if I can help it. <laughs> Other questions? Excuse me? I'm sorry. Oh, some take so long. I'm just uh, working on a project uh, for San Diego State University that's been going on for about four years, and it's a fairly simple, uh, you know, there's a lot of red tape in the way of that one. Something like Battery Park, uh, I started on two years ago, and it's going into construction this month, and it will be another couple of years before it's really finished. Um, so I think when I do some of the doorways and windows and things like that, it's really very nice to go into a room and close a door and come out two weeks later with something finished. Yes, actually somebody asked me to build a house and it, it turns out it's not going to work out, but I would really be very interested in doing something like that. It takes me so long to get from the point of, of accumulating some information to the end, uh, or to, I mean, not even to the end, but to the, like a more complete idea. Um, I end up accumulating, you know, hundreds of little slips of paper with notes on it, little drawings, and sorting that out, and uh, somehow trying to accumulate it accumulate the information in some way that it'll begin to stick together and make sense. And there's, uh, there's so much time where I'm just sitting in my studio feeling completely, um, I mean, if I had the activity of building something or drawing something, it seems like it would be much more satisfying, but I'm just kind of, <laughs> you know, something's cranking around. At a certain point, I'll start building, but I have to be really fairly clear in my thought before I get to the, that point. Usually they're just little funny sketches or something that will be where things are clarified. It's impossible to, for me to imagine walking back in that direction, just because all of my thinking is based on this, this other direction. Um, I must say that uh, as I've gone through the process of working with the, the restrictions, I'm, you know, people assume immediately, because I don't have the freedom of going into a studio, that it's that the ideas are somehow going to have to be uh, compromised or watered down. And I absolutely don't feel that that's what happens. I think when uh, people forget what it means to show in a museum or a gallery, the restrictions that are imposed on those situations are very stringent and complex. And I think it's just we've got one set or another, and if you're going to function in the real world, you have to figure out a way to, to deal with that, you know, whichever set of uh, complex uh, 
uh, weights and balances you have to deal with. But uh, I'm not completely out of that other context. Yeah, but uh, but that's not where the heart of the matter is. Uh, it's become somewhat preconceived in, this, in the sense that I, for a long time, have had to work things out in great detail ahead of time. For instance, something like the Fog Project. I had like five days to build that structure in the courtyard of the Fog Museum. I had to know like where every last nail was going to go to get it up in a short period of time. There were always either money constraints or time constraints that meant that I had to kind of go in with a real a clear idea of what was going to be happening. I, I must say that the time that I spent getting to the scale that I've gotten to has been extremely important to me. I haven't shown you pictures or slides of any of the earlier work, but it didn't. I didn't just all of a sudden start at a large scale, but kind of working up in scale with materials. I, you know, have. Um, it's not like just doing a drawing of something and hoping that it's going to work out all right. It's like the experience that you've gotten working in real space, a little bit, you know, larger or something each time, allows me to go to a place, do a lot of planning. I'll do a lot of, uh, if, when I'm working something out with string and stakes and kind of sketching in the real space, uh, trying to make adjustments uh, ahead of time. Um, one thing that I would say that I'm very, uh, I have great trepidation about with something like the Battery Park piece is that uh, usually the detail of things is where a lot of my thinking lies, how things end up being attached or put together and working out all of those last details. In something of that scale, at a certain point, the architects take over the, you know, I just can't look at every joint, every, you know, thing as I would uh, in many other situations. And I'm, I'm really, um, you know, I wonder what, what I'm going to think uh, when I see this. I mean, I will be at the site watching a lot. I'm going to be looking very closely at the working drawings, but there's, you can only look so closely. No. <laughs> Other questions? That's what's happening with Battery Park, but that's not my usual way of working. It's not the way I, I prefer to work. Because I think you know, as other people have noted, I think a lot of the problems with what gets built these days has to do with that relationship between the architect or artist and the contractor being kind of out of control and uh, strange. No. I don't. I haven't. Ha I mean, it's a luxury that I, I think one could wish for, but I, I haven't. I think
think that seems to be all. Thank you. There's a reception. There's a reception uh, following for the speaker over in the annex. Thank you.